So, how many of you love passwords? Oh, okay, well, <laughs> it, it was worth a try. Uh, I love passwords and digital authentication. Um, I have already given you this short in uh, introduction, my uh, reputation and my car plate. Uh, and as I told you, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 48 years old. Um, I have a daughter aged 13, or she's going to be 30 now in, in a few weeks. Uh, and I'm divorced. Uh, and of course, again, as I said, that has nothing to do with me being obsessed with passwords and digital authentication. But not only that, as a single male aged 45, I even do have my own YouTube channel. And it's all about passwords and digital authentication because I am the founder and main organizer of PasswordsCon, which is the first and only conference in the world which is only about passwords and digital authentication. Uh, it's a nonprofit conference that I do, uh, usually in cooperation with others. Uh, I'm now going to do it again in Stockholm in, in two weeks' time. And I've done this now since 2010 uh, at different places around the world, including Las Vegas four years in a row, and also as an example with Ruch Universität Bochum here in Germany. And this time um, it's for three full days, and we are only talking about passwords. Or as I say, if I talk about passwords, for eight hours without a break at all, and that's not a problem for me to do, I call that a good introduction to basic password security. Eight hours. So that's how obsessive I am about this topic. Now, <clears throat> back in 2016, I was contacted by the US National Cybersecurity Alliance, um, and they asked me if I would assist them in writing more or less the US government consumer recommendations on passwords. And the National Cybersecurity Alliance is the US government, but it's also Microsoft and Google and you know, blah, blah, blah. Everyone is sort of a member of the US National Cybersecurity Alliance. And these are the password recommendations that I provided for them, which are in existence uh, even today. Recommendation number one, make your password a sentence. For some reason, I don't know why, but even today, the majority of people do not know that you can also use space in your passwords. So you can write a sentence. Doesn't always work, no, because of incompetent engineers. Period. Yeah, shame on them. Yeah, you can't handle a space on a computer? <laughs> Please, give me a break. But in most systems, even Microsoft Windows, <laughs> you can use space. So you can write a simple sentence in whatever language you want, or preferably in a language you know, of course. So I can write down, I was born in Bergen, Norway, and use that as my passphrase, or password, if you like. And if you do something positive, something from your past, so for all the gentlemen, you know, try to avoid anything that has to do with your wedding date. You know, use something positive from your background, and it's easy to remember, but it's impossible, more or less, to hack. So that's advice number one. Second advice, unique account, unique password. I'm not going to say this is a requirement from my side, but it is a recommendation. The thing here is, I know this is very difficult to do. You can't remember all your passwords for all your accounts. Neither do I. I have more than 400 accounts online. And I'm no genius. I can't remember all my passwords or sentences, for that matter. So I'm done tip number three. I have written down my passwords. Or in my world, I'm using a password manager, a piece of software that will generate passwords for me completely random. It will fill them in into any application or website that I'm using. Um, and it will remember them for me. And what I need to remember is my master password for my password manager that I have on my phone, on my iPad, and on my computer, both at work and at home. And one of the things I've also done, my master password can actually be found on a piece of paper inside an envelope back home in my bedroom, next to my bed. 
And well, I haven't written it on the outside of the envelope, but I could have written digital testament. I will get back to that. And last but not least, even though I am a fan of passwords, you should use two-factor authentication wherever possible. And if you are a service provider of anything publicly online to people, you should offer them the opportunity to use some kind of two-factor authentication. Because in a way, passwords are not enough, and you should do two-factor authentication as well. Now, <clears throat> I also do bring some good news. My keynote today was perhaps a bit depressive, I think. But on my next slide, I have the best news of the day. This could be the best news this entire week for you. This could actually be the best news of the year for you, unless you got married or had a child. And I've never tried this in Germany before. I don't know, I'm not that used with a German audience, so I don't know if you, you, know, if you have a, you know, a, a standard of applauding people before they have finished talking, or if you ever stand up and applaud people, or maybe you give a whistle, or you know, as I say, if there are any singles in the room, feel free to give me a hug after ne the next slide. So I'm sort of looking forward to see the reactions to my next slide. This is going to be the best news of the day. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, we've we got to do this one more time. Are you ready for the best news for the, of the day? Yes. Good. Excellent. And that is frequent and mandatory change of passwords are stupid thing to do. <laughs> yes. Free hugs after my talk. Because, and this is, you know, this is not a joke. This is very serious research conducted not only by me, but by researchers and, and security professionals all over the world for many years. We have found that doing this to your users actually decreases security. Because instead of doing long, strong, unique passwords, people will just go into a very simple habit of Monday 1, Monday 2, Monday 3, as an example, when they are creating their passwords. That is an incredibly predictable pattern for any hacker, and thus changing your password really ain't going to do shit. In fact, 50% of you, maybe as much as 60%, or at least your colleagues, when they change their password, they will just update the password by one at the end. 50 to 60% of all employees at any large organization does exactly that. And number two, and I don't have to tell you this at all, but forcing people to change passwords frequently destroys the user experience. People hate doing this. And number three, it is actually a waste of valuable time. Have you ever received the question from any user, why do we keep on doing this? Why do we have to change our password on a regular basis? And most security people, they actually don't know why. It's just like the policy says we have to do. I saw it on Google. I Googled it, and Google said, change your password on a regular basis. Well, why doesn't Google do that to your account? Why doesn't Apple do that or Facebook? Are they complete idiots? No, they actually have pretty good security researchers. And most of them have been to my conference as well to learn how to do things. So these are the good news for the day. Maybe I have some more as well. We'll see. In June 16, during my PasswordsCon conference in Las Vegas, I had Jim Fenton, one of the authors of the new version of the NIST SP863B standard, do a talk about this standard. It was released in June 2017, so it's two years old now, or two and a half years old. And this is the US government standard for digital authentication. One of the things you can find in this standard is stop forcing people to change passwords on a regular basis. And there are other highlights in this standard as well. And I'm promoting this standard absolutely everywhere to 
my Norwegian government to governments and standard organizations in other countries as well. And just three weeks ago, I learned that the Danish National CERT team has also published new recommendations on password security, and way and behold, they are basically based on the NIST standard, which is two and a half years old. And I wouldn't mind, you know, if, you know if, if there are any here from the German BSI or similar like that, you know, give me a shout out, I really want to talk to you. I want to change the government of Germany on this stance as well, if possible. And being obsessed with passwords, I'm also very often met by people saying that, really, passwords? It's so like, uh, lame. It's like everybody was doing that 20 years ago. It's no fun anymore. Because what the really cool thing today is biometrics. And when Steve Jobs of Apple was on stage and launching the iPhone 5S, the first iPhone with the Touch ID, some smart guy, I, can't, I don't know where he, he was in the world, I think he was in American, but very shortly after the announcement of the iPhone 5S with Touch ID, he put out a single picture on Twitter illustrating the exceptional security of Touch ID. And this one picture coming up on my next slide is basically my entire opinion on the security of biometrics. It looks like this. Because people do not understand that the way we are using biometrics today for security is actually implemented as a usability feature, not for security purposes. As soon as people, friends of mine, colleagues of mine, got a new iPhone 5S, they came to me and like, ha, now, Per, now you can try to hack my phone. There's no way you could break through the, you know, the exceptional biometric security of Touch ID. And I said, well, you know, research says there's one in 50,000 possibility that I will actually have a fingerprint pretty similar to you. One in 50,000. Now, that's not good compared to a four-digit PIN with 10,000 combinations. But PIN codes are passwords, and I research PIN codes as well. And even though you have 10,000 combinations available, chances are very high that you have selected one PIN out of just 100 combinations. So these friends and colleagues, they come up to me, and I take their phone, and I say, ah, so you want, you, you want me to sort of try to break the Touch ID? Oh, yeah, try it, try it, try it. And I say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to swipe left or right so I get to the pin pad. And then, out of curiosity, which year were you born or when is your birthday? And people are like, give me back my phone. That easy. I'm no fun at parties at all because I do this party trick all the time. And way too often, I can guess your pin in one, two, or three attempts. So, you should do two-factor authentication everywhere. And today, a lot of people do that using their phone. And as I was talking about in my keynote, mobile hijacking, if I can be you, if I can be your phone, chances are that I will, in many, many cases, be able to bypass the two-factor authentication of your account or to do a password reset or account reset and still gain access to your account, as an example, in social media. I didn't mention port out and SIM swap and spoofing attacks, so I'm going to repeat them. But to me, it's very important to say that good usability provides for good security. But good security, if implemented without good usability, will be really bad security. It is pretty amazing to see what some people will actually do if security is bad. They will do pretty much anything to bypass security in order to actually do their job. And if security is implemented in such a way that it prevents your colleagues from doing their job, they're going to hate you. 
and then you will not be able to do your job properly. So as an example, when you're going to create a new account, you're usually met with enter an email address you know, as your username, and you probably have to choose a password and repeat the password on screen. But you're not allowed to see the password on screen for some reason. So first of all, entering a new website, I would say make sure that you put the cursor in the email or username field at once. So I don't have to move, move my mo mouse pointer and click in the window before I can type. It's a very small UX tip, but a lot of websites doesn't do that. Second, choose a username. Now, email addresses are, in a way, public information. If I ask you for your email address, you will most probably give it to me. Passwords are considered secrets. Usernames are not. And today, a lot of breaches online are focusing on email addresses and passwords. So if you look at Twitter as an example, where I'm very active, they actually give you the opportunity to log in using your Twitter handle, your phone number, or your email address. What they don't do is to uh, allow me to choose which of those I want to block. So if I could, I would block myself from using my email address to log in, because my email address is public information, while my phone number, as an example, could be more of a secret. It's a very small trick. My phone number is shorter than my email address, so I would have to type less, and my username would be sort of half secret. Most businesses have never thought about doing this at all. So there's a discussion to be had at many companies. Why are we only allowing email addresses to be used as usernames? Why is that? Why can't we use anything else, like phone number, or whatever random string people want to use? For password policies, most websites say, yeah, it has to be minimum eight characters long. You have to use uppercase, lowercase, specials, numbers, emojis, and a DNA blood sample. Crazy. Why? Why do you have to do that? I'm using Chinese, simplified Chinese. I'm going to do, I'm going to do my password in simplified Chinese. There's no difference between uppercase and lowercase in simplified Chinese. It doesn't exist. So are you saying that with the 15,000 different symbols I know in simplified Chinese, if I use 10 of those symbols, that's not a good enough password. You've got to be kidding me. Most password policies are made by people in the Western world for Western people. We can learn a lot from other cultures, other countries, about password security. And we also tell people, you have to choose a strong password. Well, why can't we generate a passphrase, a simple sentence, and give that to users and like, here's a passphrase for you. You can use this one, or you can choose one by yourself. Instead of always just saying, you have to come up with something, and there's no way we're going to help you with anything. Aren't we supposed to be user-focused, customer-centric? We are at Nordic Choice Hotels, and I'm working every day to improve that. We want your visit to us to be as good, as easy as possible. And also for the password field, you could have a button like an open eye or a closed eye, where you can choose to either see or hide the password on screen. Again, very simple UX trick. But at one point, I did talk to some designers who were using an open eye to show the password. And you could click, and the eye would close so you didn't see the password on screen. And I said, are you religious by any chance? Uh, no, they said. Well, have you ever watched Lord of the Rings? Oh, yeah, many, many times. And a single open eye means what? And they were like, oh! 
The evil eye, yes, in many religions, a single open eye is evilness itself. So try to avoid using symbols and use text instead. Now, I have forgotten everything I learned in my German classes when I was 15 years old. But as far as I know, the open and close or show and hide in German are more than four characters long. So you need to figure out you know, what text to use in there. Hide, show and hide. And then, if you actually allow people to see the password on screen while they type it in, type it in the additional verify your password field is suddenly redundant. And then registering for an account will take shorter time. And less work to do signing up for an account means more customers. Do it as easy as possible, but do try to maintain security. Now, my ex-wife, and she's a very good friend of mine even today, she tells me rather often that, Per, you know, you're 48 and, and you're single, and if you, you know, ever have any hope of ever meeting anyone again, you know, you have to talk about something else than pastors. You know, you, you need a hobby. You know, well, you need a life, she sometimes says as well. Uh, but, you, you know, you can't just do passwords as your hobby. You know, fishing, beer drinking, you know, play a game of chess, you know, get yourself a fast car, you know, something that you can talk to women about. And I'm like, well, I, I, I do have other hobbies as well. It's not just about passwords. And she said, no, you, passwords is the only thing you care about. And I say, no, I'm interesting, interested in pink codes as well. I say, I mean, you can't just be like shallow in one area. So back in 2013, I was at a school with uh, students aged 17 in, in Bergen on the west coast of Norway, where I live. And I asked all of them, uh, I gave them a, a, a few tasks to perform. I said, pen and paper, please, and write down your gender, male, female, or you know, alien. Very easy to do. Second, I said, Please generate a four-digit PIN code that you are absolutely sure you can remember in a month from now on and write it down on the paper. Four digits, four numbers in a PIN code that you are absolutely sure you can remember in a month from now on. And I gave them some time to think and I wrote it down. And I said, I want to collect all these pieces of paper because I do statistics on, the thi on, on these uh, things. You know, that's my view of a perfect Friday evening, is to do statistics on people's pin codes. So I do ask them to do this. And this was in 2013. And these are plus minus 17 years old. So after collecting all the pieces of paper, without looking at them, I do ask them, how many of you chose 1996? And a lot of them blushed and started laughing out loud because among the girls, 1996, which is their year of birth, was the most popular selected pin code. I mean, how drunk do you have to be before you forget the year you were born? I shouldn't ask women that, I can ask the men about that. So they laughed. But there were also some boys in the room, and they were like, stupid! I mean, seriously, come on. You can't be that stupid, these boys said. And I, you know, I, I know my own kind, because I can tell you that among these boys, 1996 was the second most popular pin code. But do I have any suggestions from the audience here today? What do you think the most popular pin code was among these 17-year-old boys? Raise your hand. 1313? 13? Uh, no. Other questions? Other suggestions? Most popular pin code selected by boys? 6969. 6969 six, and 1234. Yeah. <laughs> so, the joke goes like this. <laughs> every time I do this slide and every time I talk to people, 
no matter the country, US, Sweden, Ukraine, Norway, Serbia, many other countries where I've been, when I ask for suggestions, there will either be a male or female, of course, answering first. If it is a male, they will suggest 6969 or 1234, and in a way showing women our mentally amazing capacity. <laughs> or, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I made myself, so I, you know, I'm just I'm throwing rocks on myself here. Or it will be a female answering first. And they will also suggest one, two, three, four, or six, nine, six, nine. Thus, just proving your belief in our excellent mental capacity as men. Everywhere I go, these are the exact same suggestions coming up again and again and again and again and again. But it was not 6969 or 1234, it was 1337. Ring a bell? Are there any women here who understand the point of 1337? Raise your hand. None. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I said it out loud here, how many of you selected 1337? Some of the boys in the upper right corner, they were like, yeah! And all the girls were like, what? And I explained to them that if you read the numbers as if they were letters, it says L-E-E-T, LEET, short for elite. And if you play computer games online and you are getting beaten really, really badly by somebody else in a computer game, at the end of a round of, I don't know, Battlefield Online or something like that, PlayStation, PC, you will write back to them 1337 and maybe exclamation mark, and that means like, whoa, you're really good. And all the girls, no exceptions, they're like, oh God, no. <laughs> because none of them had, none of the girls had selected 1337, and none of them were playing computer games. And then I was at the university in Trondheim in Norway, and I did the same thing with students. And there was one woman who raised her hand. She had picked 1337. And I just, like, I ran down to her, like, you could be the woman of my dreams, I told her. <laughs> like, really, you could be the woman of my dreams. But I have to ask you, do you play computer games? And she said, no. <laughs> so still single. But she said, I understand the meaning of 1337, it's about computer games. And I was curious, and I asked her, then, why did you choose 1337? And her amazing response was incredibly simple. My postal address at home is 1337. <laughs> it's just outside the city center of Oslo, our capital in Norway which of course made all these gamer boys go like, I want to move to Oslo, just outside Oslo, city center. That's where I'm going to live when I grow old. <laughs> so this is proof of us being simple and very predictable creatures, even when you are to select a pin code or a password. And these are the most common four-digit pins in the world. If your pin is up on screen now, I do advise you to change it. But 5683, does it make any sense? 5683. Say again? Uh, no. Love. Look at the letters below the numbers. L-O-V-E. So what I have done, I've been doing some additional research on this. I've been asking people to do a four-digit memorable pin code, 
I try to do a four-digit non-memorable, I'm basically asking you, make a four-digit pin code that you think you will not be able to remember in a month from now on. And I've also been asking people to do a seven-digit memorable pin code just to see what happens. And one of the observations you can see is that if I'm asking you to use a memorable pin code, you will most likely not be using the number six in your pin code. And if I try to ask you to do a seven-digit memorable pin code, you will also most likely not be using the number six. On the other hand, if I'm asking you to do a random pin code, because a pin code that you can't remember is basically a random pin code, and you can choose anything from zero to nine, you will not be using zero because people don't consider zero to be a random number. Based on research at the Cambridge University in UK, if I can, before I leave later today, if I can steal 11 phones in this room, or 11 credit cards, the only thing I know is that you have created your own four-digit PIN code. That's all. I don't know your gender, age, birthday, nothing else. Chances are that for every 11 cards or every 11 phone, in three attempts, I will be able to guess your PIN code. <laughs> well, I'm not in the habit of stealing credit cards or phones, I'm sorry. But again, this is solid research published in academic papers, so feel free to try to disprove them. So what I have done with my daughter, uh, 13 years old, I have shown her how to do a very long pin, and she actually do not know her own pin code for her own phone. Because you look at the letters below the numbers, and typing in a very typical Norwegian name, like Johansson, that translates into 56426736. And my daughter has a 10-digit pin code, and she has no idea what the pin code is. But it is a very simple word to remember. Incredibly easy way to generate a strong pin code for your phone. I have also been supervising um, or co-supervising PhD students, master students, and bachelor students uh, in several countries. One of them was Marte Lerge at the Technical University of Norway. And she was given a task by me, and that was to figure out how do people create their Android lock patterns. This is based on work from Professor Markus Dürmuth at the Ruhr Universität Bochum. And when he presented his work on you know, how people make these uh, lock patterns, I asked him, well, I'm left-handed. Does that actually influence the way I create my patterns? And he said, no idea. We haven't looked into that. So I said to Marte, well, I want to know if left-handed or right-handed pe right people, if they, make, if they make different lock patterns or not. I want to know if you are Arabic-speaking person and write from, write from right to left, or if you are Chinese or Japanese and write from top to bottom, or if you use one of those very few languages in the world where you not only write from the right to the left, but you start at the bottom and then you go upwards on paper as well, if that will influence the way you create these lock patterns. And what we found is, well, people are predictable. 10% of everyone will be using a standard English alphabet letter as their lock pattern. And this was published in an academic paper uh, a few years ago. And I do know from police and forensic experts that that paper has actually helped them get access to phones they couldn't get into previously and been able to extract evidence, as an example, in murder cases which has been extremely helpful. I'm getting closer, but I will also talk just for a second about behavioral biometrics. One thing is normal biometrics, something you are, like a fingerprint. But there's also something called bi behavioral biometrics, the way you walk. The 
the way you wave your arms, or anything else, the way you behave, your voice. And a couple of years ago, I discovered that Bank ID in Norway, which is the service all Norwegians are using for signing into their online bank, no matter which bank you are using, it's the same common system for everyone. They had secretly been creating behavioral biometric profiles of more than two million Norwegians based on how they type on your keyboard. Because the funny thing is, if you put a keyboard connected to a computer in a room, and you ask people to go into that room and just start typing on the keyboard, write a sentence, words, whatever, and you don't know their gender, their age, or anything else, you just go in there and type. As soon as you have typed approximately eight characters on the keyboard, we can, with pretty good confidence, tell whether you are male or female. There is a distinct difference between how men and women do touch type on a keyboard. That can be measured. So I found that Bank ID had been using this, and they were using this as some sort of, not authentication, but as a fraud detection system, but they hadn't told anyone from a privacy perspective. So as a basis of that, together with a friend of mine in the UK, we created a, created a Chrome plugin called Keyboard Privacy, which essentially blocks these kind of systems from working at all because we change the difference, the speed on how you type. We change that before it's entered into the domain that you're typing into. It's available for free online. Keyboard privacy for Google Chrome. <coughs> so I do recommend you to look into WebAuthN. It's a new standard for online authentication. I'm not going to explain it. But look into it, it's really, really good, and it can make life more secure, much easier. And I will go back to the beginning about writing down your passwords, because a lot of people think that I'm joking. This is a one-minute video that I created. This is available on YouTube. Uh, the narration is in Norwegian, so I will do it in English for you instead. And I made this video after a teenage girl was kidnapped, abused, and killed in Norway, and the police called me for assistance. Newspapers asked me, how can we get access to this girl's Facebook profile to see if we can find her, because she was missing for several days. This is the video. Two our young ones. Dear mom and dad, if you are reading this letter, I have gone missing against my own will. In this letter, you will find the usernames and passwords for my email, my Snapchat, Facebook, and Instagram account. Please use it, together with the police, to come and find me. And remember that I love you. And it has been put into an envelope which says, which says for emergency use only available on the shelf in my room. Because today, people go missing, just like people have gone missing for many, many hundreds and thousands of years. And digital traces are becoming increasingly important for us to find them. So my recommendation is that if you have kids, if you have friends, family, or coworkers that you care about, Tell them to trust you and to write down their passwords on a piece of paper, which is called a digital testament, and use that if needed. Thank you. Thank you.